Welcome to a McKenzie Institute Long Talk. If you were still in charge of our relationship with America, largest trading partner, NATO ally, closest neighbor, um, what would you have your staff tell Americans about the recent Canadian election? <laughs> well, of course, I was never really in charge of our relationship with the United States. I was the top official in the, in the foreign ministry dealing with our relationship. Um, and uh, I think, and, and you know, the problem when you talk about the United States, there's so many different faces of the United States in today's world. We're talking about the Trump administration, we're talking about the president himself, are we talking about the Congress? I think one of the things that's been really important in the last few years, and we'd started doing this, you know, a long time ago as well, is, is working on an advocacy basis with various potential allies in the United States. So I think it's, it's, it's critical that we maintain this and that we keep explaining to these people why the relationship with Canada is valuable, give them our perspective. I, I think basically the message to the United States right now and our first priority should be trying to get the ratification of the USMCA. Clearly from a trade policy point of view, there's a lot going on in the world. But number, the number one business for Canada is with the United States and Mexico and the North American environment. We could maybe come back and talk about some of the other opportunities later, but, but that's critical. So I think we should be making it clear that we are intent on proceeding with the agreement uh, that has been negotiated, the new NAFTA, the Canada-US-Mexico agreement, CUSMA, or what the United States call the USMCA. Uh, we want to see that ratified to bring uh, closure to this period of disruption in our trade relations with the United States. I, you know, you can make some criticisms of this new agreement, but I think it's much better to have an agreement than not to have an agreement. And, um, and if the president thinks this new agreement is wonderful, looks a lot like the old agreement, they're not identical, uh, then I think it's, that's a good insurance policy to have that with the United States. So, what, what, what do But it depends who you're talking to. So we've got, you know, today I believe the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee is in Ottawa, going to be meeting with the prime minister and with Christia Freeland and others. And I think they're the the important point to say is that we're ready. You know, we may have had an election, but we're, we're ready to proceed with ratifying the NAFTA. Uh, there's clearly a majority for doing that in the new parliament. The conservatives are in favor of it too. Uh, the bloc is in favor of it. The Green Party has said they're in favor of it. So the only question mark really is with, is with the new Democrats. And I, I happen to think that the new get Democrats might want to say they don't like it but then when they think about the consequences of not having it at all and how many union jobs that would cost in Canada, I think they don't want to be the ones to destroy it. So basically you've got a solid parliament that's going to support this agreement. When, when you were the senior official um, and the point person on our relationship with America, you began a, a, a process of uh, advocacy and uh, seeking out allies. Who are our allies in America? <laughs> Well, we've got a lot of allies because when you look at the importance of our trade relationship with the United States, both for us but also for Americans, and I forget the exact figure, but something like uh, 35, for 35 states, their first export destination in the world is Canada. The United States sells us more fully manufactured goods than any other country in the world. Uh, in fact, more, more than China, I mean more than to the European Union, more than to Japan. These are things I think that surprise people. A lot of Americans don't really think about this unless they're reminded of it. So who are our allies? A large pr uh, number of people in the Congress, in both parties, people in the business community, our customers, our suppliers, um, people in state governments, uh, it's, it's it, you know, family contacts, friends. I think one of the things that the, the, the uh, government of, of uh, Justin Trudeau got right in the, in the NAFTA renegotiations was working with allies right across the country, working with all parties in the House of Commons, working with the provinces to make sure that we were all working together to try to 
make sure that we had a common message in the United States that that when it came to trade, there weren't really differences between different parties and different regions in the country. We wanted a strong trade relationship with the United States, and we were all going to work together to make that happen. There, there's a bit of a joke among your former <coughs> colleagues in the diplomatic corps that our main goal around the world is to remind everyone we're a separate country from the Americans and have our own <laughs> foreign policy. And uh, I'll, uh, I'll modify that. Uh, quip to say isn't one of the things to remind a lot of our allies in America we're, we're there to remind them that they are our, our, our allies. Yeah, yeah, well very much so. Um, I mean we, you, you know, this is one of the things that Canadians found so irritating about these uh, restrictions on steel and aluminum under section 232 taken for supposedly for national security reasons. You know, in what way does Canada threaten the security of the United States? And you go back and look at the number of wars we've been engaged in together on the same side and our, our other alliances, and, and it, it just doesn't make any sense. It's insulting to say that they've taken trade measures against us for that purpose. And in fact, we all know, of course, it was taken for other reasons, not really for national security. There's another old quip among your colleagues, and correct me if I'm misquoting or misquipping, and that is nothing that is ever said in public is to be taken all that seriously. It's what goes on behind closed doors among the diplomats. Is that still true? Well, I think, it, you know, you have to, uh, if, if you're, you, you know, if you're, a, if you're a, a superpower, I think you can say different things every day and people still have to sort of take you seriously. I think if you're a country the size of Canada, you really need to be on message on a consistent basis. So you can't be saying different things to different people or different things privately and publicly. There can be nuances in what you say. You may not say everything in public that you would say privately, but the messages have to be uh, supportive of each other. What would you say the Americans think of a minority parliament? Uh, an election which could precede another election very quickly. Do, do they get their minds around that? I don't, I don't really know. I don't think they spend that much time thinking about us, but I think that's one of the reasons that Neil, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee in the American House of Representatives, is up here today trying to get a bit of a measure of what does this mean. You know, if the Democrats make a deal with the President and the United States Trade Representative in terms of how to get the USMCA through Congress, uh, is Canada going to be capable of, of, of responding to that and possibly making some changes to the NAFTA, getting it through Parliament? I think they're going to want to know those things. They're going to ask about that, I'm sure. What, 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 what does this mean, a minority government? And that's why, as I was saying earlier, I think one of the messages has to be that you know, insofar as doing business with the United States is concerned, and, and in particular ratifying the the USMCA, it's going to be business as usual. That, uh, despite the fact it's a minority government, it's 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 this is clearly something that will command a majority in the Canadian Parliament. Your former colleague Randolph Mank was interviewed by the BBC recently and asked the obvious question, "What do the Americans think of this?" And he chuckled and said, "Well, frankly, they don't think of us very much yeah. at all." which is kind of what you said. Um, an analogy I've used is um, why would Roman senators be worried about what's going on in Londinium or Gaul? Um, uh, Washington really is the center of, of the world these days. Tell me about how that... The barbarians a, finally got to Rome, though. Yeah. Well, how is that a challenge for, for diplomats and trade officials um, when, you know, when the mouse is negotiating with the elephant? Well, I think we've done we've done a pretty good job in this in this negotiation. You know, we've come out with a deal. Well, not perfect, is is really um, much better than what the alternative could have been. So I think maybe we're smaller than the United States. I'm not sure the mouse and the elephant analogy. It, it's colorful. I'm not sure that really reflects the reality. I mean, there are millions of Americans who are dependent on exports to Canada, 
And um, so, so we can play our cards. We need to do it in a way that is going to be both good for us and good for Americans. And I think part of the problem with the Trump administration's approach to trade policy is they haven't really been prepared to recognize until perhaps recently that, that actually trade on a, on, a, on a negotiated basis with a solid agreement might actually be good for them as well as us. There's been too much thinking in the Trump administration that I win, you lose. Whereas, and, and, and not enough thinking about whether you can really negotiate a win-win-win approach on the trade front. And I, I think that we've got a win-win-win approach once again. And, uh, and now the president says it's the best trade agreement that's ever been negotiated. So we should take that and with a certain amount of satisfaction. Your other former colleague, uh, Paul Fraser in Washington, um, once pointed out how little Americans do think of us. One of the Buy America bills uh, passed with flying colors and they forgot to exempt Canada, yeah. uh, not realizing we were one of their largest and probably at that time their largest trading partner. So what they did was <laughs> to say, with regard to Canada, any protectionist measures shall not be funded. Yeah. So we still could be retaliated against or discriminated against, but they weren't going to fund anything that caused that to happen. Um, kind of an odd oversight, wouldn't you say? Well, that won't be the last one. But this is why it's very important to watch how they're implementing the USMCA in Congress and, 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 and why discussions like the one today here in Ottawa with, with Rep. Chairman Neal is very important. Uh, because it's important they understand where our sensitivities are and that we, we are tracking this carefully. And I know my colleagues in the Canadian government, just as we did back in the early 90s, are following very closely all these developments and the discussions between the Democrats in Congress and the administration in terms of what is it, how is it necessary to massage things a little bit in order to get uh, this agreement through Congress. Now, you uh, spent a lot of your career reading briefing notes, I assume correcting errors and omissions in them, asking for more information, making sure they were complete, I's dotted, T's crossed. What should I have asked you? What have I left out of this conversation? <laughs> well, I think, you know, the world's become a more complicated place, too. So I, uh, I, I think... It's, it's important, you know, we, we've had for many years, of course, way going, going way back to Mitchell Sharp's third option, we've had the idea that we should be diversifying our trade away from the United States. Not, not in a negative sense, but really trying to build new opportunities elsewhere and recognizing that it's perhaps not healthy to be so dependent on one market. And I think that is clearer now after our experience with the current administration in Washington than it was before. So I would say it's very important to build and make as much as we can out of two big achievements of the last few years. One is our agreement uh, with the European Union, the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement. This has given us a, a, a top quality agreement with the European Union. It's, it's the best free trade agreement that we've ever negotiated, better than the NAFTA. Um, the best one that the Europeans had negotiated up to that time too, from their perspective. So very good agreement, opens up a lot of opportunity. We're, we're starting to see some of, some of that um, coming to pass, but it's going to take a few years to make it really work properly. The other one is the with the un, totally uncommunicable name of the comprehensive and progressive agreement on Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, uh, that of course President Trump was negotiated by his, the predecessor of the Obama administration, and Trump withdrew from the agreement on his third day, I think it was their second day in office. Um, and, and much to the surprise of a lot of observers, with, with a lot of Japanese leadership, the agreement went ahead without the United States with a few adjustments. Now, these two agreements are very important for us. I mean, among other things, they provide us with, with um, one exception, uh, better access to these markets. So 
the European Union, and in the, uh, and in the case of the TPP, Japan, but also countries like Vietnam uh, and, uh, and Singapore and a number of other important markets in the, in the Asia-Pacific region, they give us better access than Americans have. We've never really been in this situation before where we have a lead on the Americans in trying to make um, a, a, a progress in terms of securing these markets for Canadian exporters. And, um, and I think in terms of the agreement with the European Union, it's looking at what's going on now, it's going to take several years before the United States can think of having a, an equivalent agreement with the European Union. Are so we we've got a very that? long lead time. And with Japan, they've just concluded a partial agreement that erodes some of our uh, competitive edge on some agricultural products, but, but it still provides us with important opportunities in Japan and elsewhere in that region that we should be taking advantage of. A and are we taking adequate advantage? Well, we are, and I think, I think the government has put a lot of resources and a lot of creativity into trying to help Canadian business deal with this. I think there's still more work to be done. I think, I think this should be a top priority. It's more important to figure out how to take advantage of those two very large agreements than to, than to continue putting a lot of effort into negotiating trade agreements with other countries. China's a separate issue. We might come to that in a minute. But I, I think, um, and with India, we, you know, it would be a big deal if we could have an agreement with India. But frankly, at the moment, they don't seem interested in having a, an ambitious deal with us and they've just announced that they're not intending to uh, to become a participant in this new agreement that's just been negotiated the uh, the regional comprehensive and economic partnership which is in in Asia involving China Korea the ASEAN countries and Australia New Zealand and India was part of that but India wasn't prepared to to go along with the level of ambition that they were looking for, which, by the way, is a much lower level of ambition than what is present in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Well, you mentioned China, so we need a couple of sentences <laughs> on China. Well, this is obviously this is an enormous challenge, um, and it plays out against a backdrop where the United States and China are trying to are jostling for who's going to be the the dominant power of the 21st century. And you know they're 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 in the midst of a trade war. I, I think it's going to take some time before they can. Uh, well, they they may have a truce. They've, they've sort of got a partial truce, but it hasn't been uh, hasn't been ratified yet, as it were. Uh, and but I think there's going to be tension in that relationship for years to come. And we're sort of caught in the crossfire. We've seen that with the uh, arrest of uh, Meng Wanzhou. The Huawei executive in Canada on the basis of a, 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 an extradition request from the United States and the retaliation by the Chinese on, uh, on two of our citizens, arresting them and holding them in tight confinement. I, I think this is, is a foretaste of the kind of problems we're going to have going forward in managing this relationship. But China is our second largest trading partner, way behind the United States, of course. So I think it's important that we, uh, we, we figure out a practical way of, of having a relationship with China that, that can benefit Canadian exporters and people who want to buy Chinese goods. But it's going to be a difficult and uncertain road. We always uh, got a lot of credit for, uh, from the Chinese for recognizing them before the Americans did. And we would preface every request with, the people from the land of Bethune would appreciate it if you would consider the following. <laughs> Do we still get that kind of credit in China? Well, I don't, I'm not a, a China expert, but, you know, I think the Chinese are, are uh, they're a great power. They're looking at what's in their national interest. And, uh, I'm, I, I, you know, I'm not sure how much, how much weight what happened in the past carries today. And, um, and of course, their principal focus is on dealing with the United States. So I think they look at their relationship with us partly through that prism, and uh, and and it's it's going to be a difficult a difficult process ahead, I believe. Well, I mean, there are things they want to buy from us, 
and they'll continue to do that. But whether we can put the trade relationship with China on the same kind of solid footing through a free trade agreement, a good quality free trade agreement, that's, that's another question. Part of the problem, too, of course, is the attitude of the United States. Um, you know, is it going to be possible for us in the near future to have a free trade agreement with both the United States and with China? You know, I'm not, I'm not sure that that is possible. Well, these days the news is pretty confusing, but thank you for the tutorial. We will be better informed and better able to uh, interpret the news because of your conversation. Thank you. Any views expressed here are not necessarily those of the McKenzie Institute, its speakers, sponsors, or supporters. But the Institute is dedicated to fostering public discussion, debate, and education about security matters. Google the McKenzie Institute to join the discussion. The McKenzie Institute is grateful to its sponsors and supporters. Some of our short pods and long talks are a result of the support of Heathbridge Capital Management Limited, the National Post, and Dundurn Publishing.